there is clear. No mouth. We'd all like cleaner air, so when you can, leave your car and walk. Drama was Coppolucci of Italy. Clean air. Are you doing your bit? Springtime, summer, autumn, winter, so the seasons go. Sometimes we get them all at once with a little rain or snow. The sun for long, it doesn't shine, it's either wet or else it's fine. Last night I said when I went to bed, <laughs> it's turned out nice again. In this hotel, I'll sleep well, it's turned out nice again. A sweet young bride then popped inside, turned down the counterpane. She shouted, ooh, I said, Pete Boo, it's turned out nice again. Turned out nice again, hasn't it? carbon dioxide that's been released over the last 50, 100 years by intense industrialisation of which the northwest of England was, you know, absolute epitome. It's out there. It has a, a lifetime that, that will last for most of this century. So the sort of climate change impacts we're talking about today will happen. They are inevitable. There's nothing we can do to stop them. We are actually creating a semi-artificial climate here on Earth due to human pollution. And it therefore means that weather and of course, cli all climate is, is a sum of individual weather events. It basically means that every single weather event now is in some way contaminated or influenced by this background of global warming. I think the bottom line is that we now have got to recognize that our climate on Earth is not a purely natural climate, it's a semi-artificial one. We're actually fashioning the climates that we and our children are going to be living in in the decades to come. People have been moving around outside today through an atmosphere that is almost certainly changing faster than in a hundred thousand years. But this change, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, so it's very easy to tune it out and to suppose it's not there. Phenology is the longest written biological record. We have records going back over 250 years. So we can look to see how the natural world has been changing over that time period. And we can relate the changes to temperature. And we can use those to predict the changes that will occur in the future. Our phenological network includes several hundred people and they range from school children right up to the retired and they're recording a whole range of fairly simple life cycle events of plants, of invertebrates, of amphibians and birds.
We've seen earlier flowering of plants, earlier leafing of trees, we've seen the earlier spawning of frogs. Most of the British butterfly fauna has been emerging earlier in the spring. Birds are migrating earlier back to this country and so on. The list is endless. Every week we get more data sets. One of the things I love most about the English countryside is it's green and it's calm and it's wet and it's mild. The typical sort of description of it as a green and pleasant land is one that I think a lot of people have in their souls. I think people don't really think about specifics of the countryside. I think it's an emotional thing for many people. And that will go with climate change. It will no longer be the countryside that has inspired people to write about it, has inspired artists and so on. It won't be like that anymore and I think that's what I will miss. Rather than specifics, it will be the, the general aura of the countryside as it is now. Well, here for the UK, we'd anticipate a continuing increase in our average temperature, probably somewhere between an extra one to three degrees of warming over the century to come. That is most likely to be associated with wetter winter conditions. Summers probably will become drier. The water is going to be more scarce. For four days, Kate Clark has had to rely on her well for any water after supplies were cut off because Mid-Kent water couldn't cope with excessive demands. The cut to supplies has left residents furious with their treatment. I'm furious. The thing that I found most irritating, and it makes me so cross, that the, the water board have told us nothing. Well, at the moment, the southeast has the highest demand per head for water. So obviously we need a lot of water, whether it's for farming or industry or domestic use. And the problem is going to be that there's basically going to be less of it about. We can expect sudden downpours right across Britain this morning. A shower uses a lot less water than a bath. Water. Are you doing your bit? There'll be more water shortages, more restrictions, more water meters. Farmers may have to have their own reservoirs on site, um, invest in irrigation and so on. All of that will require a great deal of discipline and investment, so it's going to be a big problem for people. What climate change is going to do is, is not prevent us doing our gardening in the future. It's going to give us different plants to work with, different varieties, different species. More storms, more disasters. We're going to have to get used to uh, picking ourselves up and brushing ourselves down and starting all over again. Climate change is going to uh, add a bit of spice to, to British gardens. All sorts of strange creatures are enjoying Britain's warm water these days. Vast areas of coastline have been affected by what's thought to be a shoal of lion's mane jellyfish. And although it was caught this week within sight of this very aquarium, it really shouldn't be here. I can certainly see differential pricing. Why should it be the same amount of money to come to the zoo in the worst weather as opposed to the best. Rainfall regimes in the Mediterranean are clearly winter oriented. And Britain is gradually moving in that direction. I'm not claiming by any means that we have Mediterranean climates here yet. But that is the direction in which our rainfall regimes uh, are shifting. When we did our original study of climate change, tourism was flagged up as one of the sectors that's going to be most impacted. Um, so it's really, really important that they get to grips with it, understand it, and that's why we're here today. We looked at the opportunity of picking up markets from the rest of Europe, you know, as, as the rest of Europe becomes more like Rome and unbearable, um, whether in fact we could, we could actually convince those people that they should come here. I think in about 50 years' time people will stop going, stop going abroad or they'll sort of, it'll get less because it's going to be too hot for English people to cope with, so I think they'll look for alternatives within England. People from Hampshire, for example, which is compared to Bordeaux as having the same conditions in 80 years' time as Bordeaux has now under climate change, they might go on holiday to Bordeaux and have a wonderful time. But a large number of them are going to come back and find great relief in the greenness of the, of the environment that we have here, the countryside. And I think it's 
pleasant to go somewhere warm for a while, but a lot of British people actually find it quite tiring. They don't like the insects, they don't like the dirt, they don't like the dust, they don't like the lack of water. And I think they're things that perhaps when you're on a holiday you put up with, but if you had to put up with them year round, you might be a little less enamoured of it. The rising waters of the River Derwent are gradually eating into the heart of the community of Moulton. You just feel useless. You know, we sat on the stairs and just watched it come in and there's nothing we could do. Five towns and villages in North Yorkshire are underwater to some extent. The railway line through Moulton resembles a canal. I never thought I'd be able to feed the ducks from my back, back door. Everything's just absolutely wrecked. I've never seen anything like it before. Never, ever. Push the door open, if I can. <sighs> if you live in a, a two-storey house, um, you probably lose everything on the ground floor. If you live in a one-storey, um, a bungalow or ground floor, flat or something, you lose everything, just about everything. That is the mantelpiece. You can't see it, it's only pots that stood on it now. If you're lucky, if you've had a warning, you might be able to shift some of the smaller objects out of the way. Um, if there's no warning, which is often the case, um, then, you know, a lot of people I, I've spoken to have lost practically everything. This is the view through the front window. Oops. That's looking out of the room window. There's nothing we can do. We can't even make a drink. And although our neighbours are wonderful, they're in the same boat as us. You know, well, not, not literally, <laughs> but they're in the same position, you know. This pensioner is still able to live in her home, but even the routine of daily life has taken on an air of unreality. Where are you off to? The shops? I'm going to the shops for some bread. To melt our, our bread shops, uh, clothes, well, flooded out. That is the fridge freezer floating. Now underneath there somewhere is the cooker. I don't know where exactly. People have had an appalling time. They don't need this again, but we can't guarantee it won't happen. I mean, it's a one in what, 150 year flood. Well, it could happen tomorrow again, couldn't it? Most walls probably need to have the plaster hacked off, replastered. The floorboards will have to come up to, to let the property dry out. Everywhere will need to be redecorated. You need to go out and buy new furniture, new fittings and everything. People are often having to try and cope with doing all this at the same time as, as going to work every day. And they have no kitchen for weeks. They're, they're walking with on joists because the floorboards are up. It's, it's a huge, huge strain. It's a strain on families, it's a strain on relationships, you know, and it's a physical and, and mental strain as well. We just carry on. We can't, you know, I mean, we can't close down. We've got to just check it all off and get on with the job. Roll the sleeves up, get out, get it done. Most people agree today that climate change is, is happening and that we're likely to see more extreme weather events, including flooding, flash flooding in the future. People need to be aware of this. If they're living in a floodplain, they need to be aware that they're living in a floodplain and they need to be aware of what actions they, they can take should, you know, should a flood warning be issued. For over 160 years, the Belltoot Lighthouse has been perched on the edge of Beachy Head. Built to warn seafarers of the dangerous rocks, she is now in peril herself from the crumbling cliff. This morning, the operation began to move Bell Toot 55 feet away from the cliff edge to safety. It's been a race against time for us. The, uh, the project was originally a seven and a half month project, but as we were working, the cliff was falling away, and so we accelerated the program. 
The biggest problem in the southeast is going to be rising sea levels in terms of the coastline. Lots of low-lying marshes and spits and other parts of the countryside that we are familiar with in the coast are going to disappear. When we look at sea level rise, the major reason for sea level rise has nothing to do with ice sheets or glaciers, in fact. The major reason for sea level rise is simply that warmer water in the oceans expands. As it expands, it consumes a bigger volume, so it rises. Now, for that process of expansion to happen throughout the world's oceans is very likely to take hundreds and hundreds of years. So sea level rise, almost no matter what we do to try to limit greenhouse gas emissions, sea level rise will be with us for many, many generations to come. The Environment Agency's official responsible for planning East Anglia's future flood defences from the Thames to the Wash is Mark Dixon. I live right by the sea, right by where the floods are going to happen. Are going to happen? Are going to happen. They will happen. When Paramount cameramen flew over Canvey Island at the height of the cyclonic gale, it was not known how many of the 12,000 inhabitants were dead. The cyclone struck the country perhaps as never before. Nature's onslaught was so swift and heavy that thousands of people were trapped for hours in their homes. There were known to be 130 dead, and the missing made the ominous total of nearly 500. Still, the sea inundated the land. Which farmland the salt will render barren for some years? I know a tide is going to come through. Through this door, that tide will come. <sighs> You're now inside my house. And I've had to adapt my house to cope with that flooding. The floor is raised by about a foot. Quarry tiles on the floor, a drain here in each room to take that salt water away. And this might look like ordinary plaster. In actual fact, this is the same material that they have on the insides of swimming pools. So, Mark, you brought me into a house which is like a swimming pool. Right, living inside of a swimming pool, exactly what it is. Living with a swimming pool, what's going to happen one day? The water will be through here a metre deep, um, and I've adapted the house. Electrics up, a metre and a half. Woodwork, which has been waterproofed and held together by bits of copper. Goodness me, you're in a house that's designed to go underwater. Indeed it is, yeah. These are hard realities. You can no longer, or no, no sooner, cancel sea level rise than you can say, I don't want winter anymore. It's going to happen. It's a fact of life. I think there's very little doubt that climate change, because it's inexorably linked with rising sea level, that would increase the, the risk of major coastal flooding episodes. And that's one of the reasons why the Environment Agency have commissioned a re-evaluation of the level of protection that the Thames Barrier offers to London. The Thames Barrier was constructed in 1980. Uh, it didn't take rising sea level due to global warming uh, into account when it was designed. I think if I was trying to predict where to live now, obviously near a coast is, is quite high risk. In a floodplain is quite high risk. On a clay bed is quite high risk. So you've got to try and avoid all those three factors. If you're on a hill, you're obviously exposed to windstorm, but you're above a flood level. So that is an obvious trade-off there. You've got to be sort of mid-region, mid-height, mid-type of soil, effectively. It's sort of middle of the road choice of all three factors. He couldn't quite believe what he was witnessing a sight familiar through television and cinema, but here, twisting over Staffordshire. All of a sudden, all this wind came up, and it was very, very dark. Listen, hello. Look round, I saw a table come across. The future UK climate scenarios predict an increased wind speed of 4% across the UK. It doesn't sound much, but when you start looking at the force of the roof edge, that can be a factor, 16% increase, 20% increase. So you've got to start trying to design the new roofs for the future with that in mind. Present roofs might start to fail.
And this thing was set up to teach people about the environment in a way which didn't make them feel miserable. You know, I mean, we actually pitched for this job right at the beginning, uh, and there were about four other design companies all pitching for the same project, and we were the only one that didn't sort of try and represent the disaster which was going to happen. You know, I think everybody else had sort of scrapyard imagery in there. Making people miserable doesn't necessarily get them to learn because what it tends to do is make them think, oh, I couldn't possibly do anything, all is lost, you know, it's a disaster. And what we've tried to do is say, well, hang on a minute, mate, it's not actually that bad. You know, if you turn your telly off before you go to bed at night, you actually can do quite a lot. So we've tried to be encouraging, really. And that's worked, definitely. The earth is getting hotter. Left unchecked, we face an uncertain future. Europe could become a desert. Drinking water may be rationed. We must act now. Write to your MP, voice your concern. Make a donation, your gift counts. Alternatively, say bollocks to it and enjoy the sunshine while you still can. Along the promenade I stroll It may be sticky but I never complain It's nice to have a nibble at it now and again Every day, wherever I stray The kids all round me flock My mum used a lot of ideas from Mediterranean school of painting They bright primary colours provoked two different reactions. One that shares in that optimistic view, sees climate change as a potential great benefit, you know, much more outdoor sort of life, strolling on the promenade on, on hot summer's evenings and having a drink in the local cafe, that sort of thing. On the other hand, some people have indicated they think it's even quite irresponsible to promote such a positive view of climate change because they say, well, the coastline might not be there by 2080 because of rising sea levels and storm surges. What about water resource? Will there be enough water to supply Blackpool? What about gales? What about the effects upon biodiversity? So, you know, we shouldn't have this positive image. So it's quite an interesting case where you get, it's a sort of fulcrum for two quite different perceptions which in the end I don't think we can say one is right and one is wrong, but it's the, we have to some find, find a way of, of managing the diversity. The, the idea that, uh, that concern for climate change is, is simply navel-gazing or crystal ball-gazing um, is absolutely ludicrous. It's already costing tens, hundreds of thousands of pounds for changing climate. For businesses, it's causing human misery. I mean, whether you take that from you know, people who have been flooded out, or whether you take it to somebody who has suffered wind damage to their home, or just simply the fact that people have very uncomfortable summers now. There are people having strokes during extreme summers because of climate change. Uh, it doesn't get much more extreme than that. So these are real events. They're getting worse, and we need to get ready for them. Um, and uh, yes, it's scientific. Yes, it's long range, and yes, it's difficult. But it doesn't mean it isn't important. influencing climate but we're doing it in ways that actually we don't understand and in ways in which the outcomes are very poorly defined. We actually are running possibly quite serious risks of having quite undesirable outcomes with our climate system. This bus has no engine, seats or chassis, although there is a trailer for luggage. It runs on pupil power. There's an adult driver and conductor, and the passengers wear reflective bibs. It makes scheduled stops right outside each child's home. The children approve. I like it better than going in a car because 
you can see more things. There's not as much pollution as there would be with loads and more loads and cars coming. Pupils are encouraged by getting loyalty stickers exchangeable for books. The drivers are all volunteer parents. It's safer for the children and it's a peace of mind for the parents because somebody else is walking their children to school. What's encouraging is that now this stuff's on the national curriculum, the children are really interested in it. And I think that the future lies with them. The only problem is that we've still got a generation of Range Rover drivers. And, um, you know, people of my age can still do quite a lot of harm before we snuff it in 25 years' time. I think we're at the stage at the moment where public can't do a great deal except inform themselves and do everything they can that is environmentally sustainable. So whether it's recycling or using their car as little as possible, those things will contribute to cutting the future emissions and future climate change. Global warming might finally give us the push to move out of the oil era and into a new solar energy wind power era and that will be good for us in so, so many different ways. We're going to have to make this transition sooner or later. The sooner we make it, the less painful it will be, the more profitable it will be for us. We can make a lot of money out of uh, devising new eco-technologies. The sooner it comes, the better. And climate change might one, one day provide the trigger. We're talking about the installation of solar energy cells. Well, I think this uh, sort of explains itself. It's uh, absolutely marvellous. And if we can utilise the, the world's natural resources, and we should do that without polluting anything else. Filling up the car with fuel has become an impossibility. You do not automatically have the right. 